Hello there, I'm Thundaga, and welcome to my How to Make a Pokemon Game tutorial series. This series will cover all of the essential info you need to make a Pokemon game in RPG Maker and Pokemon Essentials. In this episode, we'll be looking at doors and other map transfers. First, we'll discuss how to set up door events, and how to move in and out of maps through the use of these doors and map transfers. After that, we'll talk about how to set up stairs and elevators. And lastly, we'll discuss cave entrances, because those need to be set up a little differently than other map transfers. With all that said, let's get into it. So in Test Town here, I've gone and created a couple indoor maps. I've created this one here for our player's home with a bottom floor and a top floor, and then I've created one here for our neighbor's home. Right now we can't enter or exit these homes though, so what we need to do is we need to set up some door events. Thankfully, these are pretty easy to set up, and some very good example door events have already been made on the base essentials maps. For example, here in the Larusian city map, we can find some great door events for us to learn from and copy over into our test town. There are some standard wooden doors here for some of the homes, as well as some sliding glass doors for the Mart and for the Pokemon Center. Both of these types of door events effectively function the exact same, with the only differences being the sound effects that play when the door is opened, and the door event graphic that's set. So let's go and grab one of these standard wooden doors here, and let's copy over into our test town. What we can do is we can select it and then hit Ctrl C to copy it, then we can go to our test town, then we can click on our player's house and hit Ctrl V to then paste in the event. Now that we've copied it over, let's break down how this door event works and modify it so it takes us to the correct map and uses the correct door graphic. Before we get started, I'm also going to rename this from Fan Club Door to just Door. There we go. The way that these door events work is that they have two event pages. Page 1 is for going into the door, and page 2 is for coming out of the door. Page 1 is set to trigger on player touch, so when we walk into this door event, it will then activate and run all of the event commands. The event commands start with a move root here that plays a sound effect, which is in this case door enter, and then it animates by turning to face different directions. As we mentioned in an earlier tutorial, character sprites have four directions, and this is also used by the door sprites where their four directions in their graphic are used as four frames of animation for the door opening and closing. So when the door is closed, it's facing down, and then as it opens, it faces left, and then right, and then up for fully open. This cool setup here can be used for a lot of different event animations. In the event, double check and make sure that stop animation is not enabled in the event settings, since that will cause the door to cycle through all four columns of the character graphic as it sits there, and that doesn't look good. For our door, let's also make sure that we select the graphic that matches our house. I think that looks like the second door here within the Doors 1 character graphic. If we look through the full list here, we can see that there are a lot of different door graphics that come with Pokemon Essentials. I've even got more downloaded here from Ecat's Gen 3 Tile Resource and Pokemon Shattered Light from when we did the Tile Sets tutorial. Now that we've got the correct door graphic on page 1, we also need to make sure that we select it on page 2. This way the door will look the same going in as it does when we're coming out. What the door event commands do next from here is make it so that way our player moves up into the door and then briefly turns through on so the player can always walk into this door tile. After that, it then makes the player transparent. After that, it calls a script command so that way following events will walk into the door also, if you happen to have any. And I'll cover those in a later tutorial. Then, after that, it does the door animation, but in reverse. So, from our door facing up, it then turns right, and then left, and then down so that it's closed. After that, it fades to black, and then makes the player visible again by setting the change transparent flag to normal. And then lastly, it transfers the player to the new map, and then fades in from black. I hope this all makes sense so far, and thankfully, for our event page 1 of our door, we only need to make one more change. Let's go into the transfer player event command here and edit it, so that way instead of taking us to the Pokemon fan club map, it takes us to our home map. Let's also go and make sure that it places us on the little doormat here on the first floor. Then let's hit OK, make sure that we're facing up when we enter, and then bada boom, that's it! Now we have a perfectly functional door event. But we're not done yet, because we also need to cover how page 2 works, and then we also need to make it so that we can actually leave our home. Right now we can go in, but we can't get out. The way that page 2 of the door event works is that it's set to auto run, and check if we're standing on top of it, with the conditional branch check of get self on event. If we are standing on the door, it will play the door animation and make us walk down, and so on. Then, at the very end here, it does a script command to set temp switch on A for temp switch A. 
The way Temp Switches work in Pokemon Essentials is that every event has Temp Switches, and Temp Switch A can be accessed via the Global Switches 21 and 22 for on and off respectively. These Temp Switches always default to false. You may also notice that the condition for page 2 of the door here is Global Switch 22. This is checking for script TS off A. So page 2 of the door will auto run here if temp switch A is off, which it always is by default when we first enter the map. This means that page 2 is guaranteed to trigger when we first enter the map. If page 2 triggers and we're not standing on the door, then it will just skip everything inside of the conditional branch and then go to the end and turn temp switch A on. Then that'll make it so that way the door event just returns to its page 1 state. But if we are standing on the door, then it'll make us and then any following events of ours transparent, and then it'll play the door animations and sound effects before moving us downward and then making us no longer transparent and so on and so forth. Hopefully that all makes sense, and if it makes you feel any better, I tend to just copy and paste my doors a lot and edit their graphics or sound effects mostly. I've never really even needed to edit page 2 of a door before. Anyway, there we go! We're all done with the door event for the outside of our home. Now, let's make an event for the inside of our home so we can then walk out through the door. Since we use the base essentials map events for the outside door, let's also do that for the inside. I'm going to copy this event from the Larusian Town Pokemon Daycare map. And thankfully, these events are so much more straightforward. What they do on player touch is they just play a sound effect and then fade to black, they wait a little, transfer the player, and then fade back in. Let's copy this event and then go into our home and then let's paste it right here. The only thing that we need to do now is edit the transfer player location. Let's go in and edit it and then let's go and select our test town. We need to make sure to click directly on our door here so that way we're standing on top of the door when we do the transfer. As one more important note, make sure that this door tile is set to passable in the tile set as well. If this particular tile is not passable, then the player will get stuck when trying to exit the door, and that's not good at all. And with that, I think our door events here are all set up and ready to show off. When we walk in, we hear the sound effects and we see the animation and such, and then when we turn and walk down, we can leave and we hear the door sound effects and we see the door animation and everything. I think this looks great! One thing that's interesting to note is that this indoor transfer event that we made is the basic structure of how most other transfer events are set up. I like to think of it almost like a map transfer sandwich, where there's this transfer player event in the middle here, and then there's also some fades and sound effects before and after the transfer. You can see this done in so many other maps too. For example, in the ice cave map, there are these ladders that go up and down to the different levels of the ice cave, and here we can see that all it does is do a fade, then transfer and fade. This is just the same as our other map transfer, but with no sound effects. As another example, there's this hole event here, where if you fall down the hole, it does a fade and transfer with sound effects, but it also makes the player transparent for a brief moment so it looks like they disappeared down the hole. Then it makes them visible again after the transfer player command. I'm telling you, the map transfer sandwich is real. You just need to put a little bit before and a little bit after, and you'll have a nice looking map transfer event. This is also true for stairs, since they follow the same logic, just with a little bit of player movement before the transfer. If we look at the stairs here in the default home map from Base Essentials, we can see that there is a move route here with a wait for move completion, and then the rest of the event is just our standard transfer sandwich. The move route makes the player through and always on top, and then it turns them right to face the staircase, and then they just move up or right, which means they walk up and right diagonally. After that, it just turns off through and always on top, and then the rest of the event is straightforward. If we look at the other stairs, we can see that going downstairs is the exact same, but instead of walking down and left diagonally, we just walk left. Let's go and copy both of these into our home map now. What I did was I pasted the stairs going up right here at the base of the staircase, and then the stairs going down here at the top of the other staircase. Real quick, we need to also go in and make sure that the transfer player transfers us to the correct location, so I'm going to go in and make sure that it transfers us to the home right here at the top mat. Then let's go to the other one, edit the transfer, and then instead let's go home and transfer us here to the bottom mat. And there we go! I think that's basically all we need to do for our stairs here. Now, when we walk into our stairs in our home, we can see that our character moves up and right, and then it initiates the transfer. I think that looks pretty good. Now, let's walk down the stairs. We'll see that they just walk left, and then, boom, we appear at the base of the stairs. That's a very simple and straightforward staircase. And of course, if the stairs are facing the opposite direction, then the player should move up and left. Just make sure that the direction the player is facing after going up or down the stairs makes sense, so that way they're facing away from the staircase. 
Now let's talk about something a little bit more complicated, which are elevators. A great example of an elevator is here in the Sodolan City Department Store. The way that it works is that there's a single elevator map here that we can access from every floor of the department store. When we walk through the elevator door to enter the elevator, a variable is set based on our current floor. This variable is global variable 10, which is elevator current floor. So on floor 1, we set the variable to 1, and on floor 2, we set the variable to 2, and so on. This variable determines what map we'll go to when we leave the elevator. So if the variable is set to 3, and we walk out of the elevator, then we'll be taken to the third floor. Inside of the elevator exit event, we can see that there are a bunch of conditional branches here for this elevator floor choosing. So if the variable is equal to 5, then we'll go to floor 5, and so on. And then at the bottom, we can see that floor 1 is the default value. If the variable ever gets messed up somehow and is set to a crazy value like 200, then we would still go to floor 1, since that's the default and it's not equal to 5 or 4 or 3 or 2. We go to the default, which is 1. Now the final piece of the puzzle is how this variable gets changed inside of the elevator. Here in the top left corner is an event with the elevator buttons where we can choose a floor. When we choose a floor, it then does something really interesting. It sets global variable 11 to our destination floor, and then it compares variable 10 to variable 11 to find the difference in floor numbers. When we scroll down in the event here, we can see some of these checks. If the two variables are equal, then the event just exits because we didn't move anywhere. If one variable is greater or lesser than the other though, it then goes through the elevator animation where there are sound effects and screen shakes, and the three events on the elevator wall rotate to animate. This first conditional branch here is if our new floor is greater than our current floor, so we're moving upwards. This second conditional branch here is if our new floor is less than our current floor, so we're moving downwards. After a single round of those animations play, it then updates our current floor variable by adding or subtracting one, depending on if we're moving up or down. After that, it uses jump to label start to jump all the way back up here to the top of those two conditional branch checks. Then it does the checks again. If the difference in floors is still negative or positive, then we run through the animation process again, and then we update our floor again, and then we do the checks again. We keep cycling through these animations until the destination floor and the current floor are the same, so we finished moving. At the very end, if the value of the current floor and the destination floor are equal, it then stops sound effects and plays one final new sound effect for elevator end, and then the event ends. Hopefully that all made sense, but let's show it off now in game. If we're on the first floor and we walk into the elevator, our current floor will be set to 1. Now let's go and interact with the buttons here and let's select the third floor. So it should play the animation twice and it played the corresponding sound effects. That was pretty nice. Let's actually go up to the fourth floor. Awesome. If we walk outside, we can see that we did arrive at the fourth floor. Now let's test it even further. Let's go down to the third floor and walk in. So now our floor should be set to 3. If we go and select 3, nothing will happen because we're already on the third floor. Okay, now let's just go back to the first floor. And then if we walk outside, beautiful! I think that is looking like a great example of an elevator event. If we ever wanted to reduce the number of floors for the elevator, then it would be as simple as removing some of these choices from the elevator button event. For example, we could make it so that way we could only pick floors 3, 2, and 1 as our destination floors. The elevator event as it's currently set up will still work perfectly fine. If we wanted to add a floor though, here's what we'd need to do. Step 1 would be to make sure that the new destination floor can be chosen from the floor choices, and it has its own destination floor number. In this example, I made a basement floor as floor 0, so it's one floor underneath floor 1. Step 2 would be to actually have a new map to go to, so I made a quick little basement map here called Sodolan Department B1F. Step 3 would be to make an elevator door event that takes us back to the elevator map and sets the elevator current floor to the proper value, so in this case, 0. And step 4, the last step, would be in the elevator door exit event to make a conditional branch that transfers us to the new map for our floor number 0. We can do this as a simple addition as its own conditional above the rest, where, if current floor equals zero, what we do is we then transfer the player to the basement map, we fade in, and then we exit event processing. The reason we'd want to exit event processing is because if we don't, the event will continue running after this, and then it'll still transfer us to floor one. And we want to make sure to fade in here, because if we don't, then the screen will still be black from before when we did change screen color tone. Typically the fade happens at the end of the event, but since we're using exit event processing early now, we want to make sure that we do fade back in. Now let's test this out in game. We walk into our elevator, and then if we go and interact with the elevator buttons here, we'll see that there is a new option here, which is B1F. 
If we select it, we'll go down one floor, so we should see the elevator animation just play once. There we go, so now the current elevator floor should be zero. When we walk out this door, we will now be taken to the new floor here, which is floor zero. I think this looks pretty good, and as you can see, it's pretty easy to add or remove floors from the elevator. Now the last thing we need to talk about is cave entrances and exits. These function basically the same as any other standard map transfer event, but with one important addition. Let's look into how the cave entrance is set up here on Route 3 of the Base Essentials maps. We can see that the event is our standard map transfer sandwich with sound effects and fades, but there is also this script command here for PB Cave Entrance above the transfer player. PB Cave Entrance is very important and should always be used when entering a cave. This is because PB Cave Entrance does two things. It makes a special animation play for the fade when we're entering the cave, and it more importantly sets our escape point. The escape point is what allows the escape rope and dig to work, since using these in a cave will take you out of the cave and bring you back to that escape point. If you forget to use PB Cave Entrance, then you will not be able to use an escape rope or dig to leave the cave, since there's no escape point ever set. You can also see this if you debug warp into a cave. The same issue will occur since you can't use the escape rope or dig because there's no escape point to return to. Equally important, when we exit the cave, we also need to use PB Cave Exit here. PB Cave Exit also makes a special animation play, and it erases our escape point. Once we leave the cave, we no longer need that escape point, so we should make sure to erase it. If we forget to erase the escape point, then we'll be able to use the escape rope or dig while we're out of the cave to return to that point. Worth noting, the use of escape rope or dig also erases the escape point, so we can't use them repeatedly while we're out of the cave. Let's go ahead and copy this cave entrance, and then let's go back to our Route 2 map. As we can see here, I've made a little cave, and I want to be able to enter it. So let's copy it and make it so that way the transfer takes us to this new map, which I'm calling Cool Cave. And let's place our player right here in front of the cave entrance. Let's also go into the Ice Cave map and copy the cave exit, then go into our Cool Cave map and paste this here, and then let's edit it so it takes us to the cave entrance, which is in Route 2, right here. We want to appear directly on the cave entrance because the cave entrance event also has a page too. Let's hit OK, and then let's see what I'm talking about. This function's basically the exact same as our doors, where there's the temp switch and it makes our character move if we're standing on the event. There's no rotation here because there's no door that needs to open or close, so this is kind of a more stripped down version of a door event. We've made all the changes that we need to, though. Our cave entrance uses PB Cave Entrance. Then if we go into our cave map, our cave exit uses PB Cave Exit. So now let's show off both of those in game real quick. So here I am on our route to, when I walk into the cave map, we see the transition play, and now we are in Cool Cave. If we decide to use Dig or an escape rope, then we'll be able to escape and return back to route two. Beautiful, and now if I try to use it again, it won't work because our escape point has been erased. Now if I walk back into the cave, and then if I try to leave, there we go, we were able to transition out and now we're back here. There is one small thing here that I noticed though that I would like to improve. When we're walking here through the exit, I notice that we appear on top of the exit. Thankfully, this is a very easy fix. What we want to do is make it so that on the second layer here, we use this lit tunnel tile for our cave exit, but above it, we also want to make sure to use this tunnel tile on layer 3, since it's a higher priority and will appear above the player as they walk through the tunnel to exit the cave. And here's how that looks in-game now. Much better. It looks like we're actually walking through the entrance and exit. I think this is a fantastic looking cave entrance and cave exit. We got it all set up. And that does it for this tutorial on doors and map transfers. I hope you feel more comfortable with making door events and other types of map transfers like stairs and elevators and caves. Just don't forget to use PB Cave Entrance and PB Cave Exit for your caves, all right? Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you learned something from this tutorial, please remember to like and subscribe. To access my tutorial website, please check the link in the video description. As a reminder, this tutorial video was made for Pokemon Essentials version 21.1, so in the future, it's possible that the layouts of some things could be changed. In general though, this series should get you where you need to go when it comes to making your own Pokemon fan game. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you learned something, and I hope you have a good one. Best of luck to you in your Pokemon fan game endeavors. Bye now!